Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I want to encourage you to pick up Slime Incorporated. It's my first full-length detective novel, and it combines elements of classic detective fiction, but in a very uh, modern setting. It's set in Boise, Idaho, against the backdrop of the Idaho governor's race. The book is available as a paperback, an ebook, or an audiobook through audible.com or in the iTunes store. You can also find it at store.greatdetectives.net. Well... Today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe originally aired May the 16th of 1950, and the title is The Cloak of Kamehameha. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. Those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Cloak of Kamehameha. message that was delivered by a repulsively wide-awake boy missing a two front row center. Arrived at six in the a.m. and had come in two parts. The first scrawled in black ink on a wrinkled piece of paper said, Marlowe, get hold of a taxi cab. Pose as the driver yourself and at exactly eight o'clock this morning, come past 8840 North Ogden Drive. Signed, Pollard Schindler. The second half had made more sense. It was printed in neat letters on neater green paper. And under an engraving of Benjamin Franklin read 100 silver dollars, <laughs> payable to the bearer on demand. So at exactly 8 o'clock, I was behind the wheel of a hired cab, leather jacket, peak cap, toothpick, and all, and within hay taxi distance of number 8840. Mr. Pollard Schindler, a round man in square clothes with haircut to match, was not late. Who there? Taxi, ready? Yes, sir. Ready? Cab? Of course. Why do you think I'm shouting my head off? I want to go to the International Airport. You understand? The International Airport at Inglewood. Okay, okay, Inglewood. International Airport it is. Marlo, the meter. Quick, put the flag down. Every minute I'm being watched. Huh? Oh, yeah. Watched by whom, Mr. Schindler? I don't know. Now, listen carefully, Marlo. Later, you are to go to the Halimawana Hotel and wait for a young lady named Lenny Collier. Uh-huh. Then, at the hour she designates, you go to her house... Number 44, Diamond Head Circle, and pick up the cloak. Now, wait a minute. Holly Moana, Led Diamond, what is it? The hotel isn't by any chance in Hawaii, is it? Didn't I mention this in my note? Oh, you didn't. Or did you mention picking up a cloak? Uh, that just proves I haven't been myself ever since yesterday. Yesterday, I received this anonymous letter that's postmarked Honolulu. All it says is, Kamehameha's cloak of golden feathers will bring no less than death. Oh, great. Marlo, have you ever been to the island? Yeah, twice. Once on business and once pleasure. But then surely you've heard people speak of King Kamehameha. Yeah, I think I do. He was back around the 1780s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big organizer conquered Oahu by driving the defenders over the cliff that divides the island in two in the... The uh... Pali. Oh, yeah, Pali. Now, Marlo, the feathered cloak that Kamehameha wore was about a hundred square feet and every inch of it a golden yellow feather. Uh-huh. And valued at more than half a million dollars. Hey, how come? The feathers. Oh, the feathers. Yes. Yeah. They are from the now extinct black mama bird, Marlowe. There was only one yellow feather on each bird. Well, I could explain why they're now extinct. But don't tell me that all this is a game of Collier to Marlowe to Schindler with a cloak that belongs to the museum. Oh, no, Marlowe, it isn't with the cloak you speak of. But Lani Collier has another one. Uh, less valuable, of course. It's one quarter the size. Oh. But it also belonged to the king. And it also is made of the priceless feathers. And is this her property to have in a whole legal like? Yes. Uh, Lani is wealthy. Oh, about 25. Went to fashionable schools here in California. 
And as a result, cares more about fun and pretty clothes than she does priceless heirloom. I can't understand that. Uh, so, for $50,000, I have bought the cloak to resell to a New York millionaire for almost twice that sum. Hey. Uh, he loves the island, Lord. Marlo, huh? I was right. I'm still being followed. Don't look back. Drive faster? No, do nothing. Oh. Exactly as I want it. Now, whoever it is will follow me, not you. And when I am in Honolulu, they will still follow me. Well, I take care of the business on hand. Huh? Yes. Now, there's a reservation for you on the next plane. So, after you leave me and collect your cab fare, which will be $500, you drive away. Then later, Marlowe, get back here. Aboard your plane and underway. And tonight, when I've got the cloak? Take it back to your hotel room at the Hale Moana and sit on it hard. Because unless I am a complete success as a decoy, you will have your share of trouble, too, I'm sure. But Marlowe... From what specific direction it will come, I do not know. I got the 500 bucks to cover expenses for my Honolulu trip and was told to keep the change. Back in my apartment, I packed, got another cab, set International Airport, Inglewood, and settled back to think about the crossroads of the Pacific. There I was wrong. Because in the next minute, and those that followed, everything was done the hard way. First, we ran out of gas, then got tied up in a traffic jam, and after that, got stopped for speeding. All of which added up to me at the airport, just in time to watch my plane take off without me. A few minutes later, when I told a cherubic clerk in a gray flannel and insipid smile that my name was Philip Marlowe and that I wanted a reservation on the next flight, which was leaving in an hour... Things got even worse. You can't be Philip Marlowe, sir. That is not the Philip Marlowe who was on flight 21 that just left. You, uh, you have a reason for saying that, for huh? Better, <laughs> I most certainly do. Ah. There were 36 seats on that plane, sir, and when she took off, all 36 were full. I know, I know, I checked them myself, and I don't flight make mistakes. Well, Denver, bully to you, boy. But I happen to be five. both Philip Marlowe and the man who was supposed to be on that plane. Uh, also, Buster, I'm just about out of patience. How do I get on the next plane or don't I? Come on, I can't stand indecision. Uh, well, well, I... You I, what? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Marlowe, I, uh, I think it can be arranged. That's better. As a matter of fact, I'm almost sure of it. Later, the last of California had slipped over the horizon. And there was only clear sky ahead. Oh, I began to relax. My mind drifted pleasantly. <sighs> Frosted Hawaiian punches. Warm white beaches. Lovely hula. Again, Diamond Head was in front of us. And majestic in the red glow of the evening sun that gave all of the lush Moana Valley I could see a texture of thick velvet. We landed like the airport was made of marshmallows. And a half hour later, I was in the lobby of the Holly Moana Hotel. It was cushioned rattan and Philippine mahogany over cool tile. And everywhere, laughing, sunburned people wearing anything from Catalina swimsuits to pea-fabricated hula skirts. So smiling both inside and out, I worked briskly to the reservation desk and told a good-looking Hawaiian in white flannel that I was Philip Marlowe. But at his reply, I stopped smiling both inside and out. But, sir, your reservation was taken two hours ago. There must be some mistake. Some mistake? You are Philip Marlowe of Los Angeles, sir. Yes, so right. And look, I've been through this before today because of what I thought was an error due, due, due to... Due to what, sir? Nothing. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> a large circle of mirror on the wall behind the clerk. And even as we had talked, I caught the reflection of a beautiful tan girl in cocoa brown suit, white pearls and no stockings. With the mention of my name and then a take that made her long blonde hair whip straight out. When she saw me watching her, she pivoted sharply on a spiked heel and hurried toward the lanai under the banyan tree, where there was Hawaiian music and a lot of different looking people drinking at glass top tables under a three-quarter moon. I stayed near the reservation desk long enough to light a cigarette. Then I followed her. She was seated away from the lobby entrance, and on a hunch that she just might be Lani Kalia, I started for an empty table next to her. But a middle-aged Chinese and gay gabardine, 
Panama to match, slipped into the chair that I was after. So I forgot about being subtle and addressing her as Mrs. Collier, introduced myself as an old and dear friend of Pollard Schindler's. One Leland Dunn. Well, this is a pleasant surprise, Mr. Dunn. But tell me, how did you know what I looked like? Well, Paula Schindler's accent doesn't hamper his vocabulary, Miss Collier. Oh. He used the right adjectives, believe me. <laughs> I'd love to. But I can't, Mr. Dunn. Because Pollard Schindler never saw me in his life. All our business was done by telephone. Okay, my mistake. I'm Philip Marlowe, Lanny, and I want to know when we rendezvous at 44 Diamond Head Circle for the cloak of Kamehameha. The cloak... Look, you're no more Philip Marlowe than you are Leland Dunn. And if you need a reason, it's because I just left Philip Marlowe on stage. Now, look, baby, there's only one Marlowe. That's me. I can prove it. I'll bet you can. Forged papers and all. <laughs> I've already been warned to watch for imposters, so quit wasting both your time and mine and get out of my way. I've got things to do. Now, wait a minute, Lonnie. What Listen. For? Proof that you're actually Kamehameha himself? No, thanks, mister. Goodbye. <laughs> I had two clues. One, an obvious party who'd assume the name of Philip Marlowe, and the other, Lonnie Collier. Less obvious, but more intriguing. So figuring the road company Marlowe would keep, I followed Lonnie. By this time, was getting into a long yellow convertible. Before I got to her, she lurched from the curb, so I ran across the street to what I thought was a taxi. But I was wrong. Because it turned out to be a chauffeured limousine and being helped in by a small, swarthy item of dubious lineage in a wrinkled cotton uniform was the Chinese in gay gabardine in Panama to match, who had been sitting near us in the lanai. What counted more was that he obviously sensed my problem. You wish to follow the girl, sir? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a lover's batch. You know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Jolo, quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, you know where she's going, sir? I'm not sure. Maybe Diamond Head Circle. Maybe he's bleeding, sir. Oh, well, then let's make a diamond head circle. Is there a faster way there, a shortcut? Oh, yes, there is. Jola. Okay. Hello. Yo. Yo. Which means what? Means uh, never mind diamond head circle. Drive fast to the factory instead. And do not move, Mr. Marlowe. Marlowe? Oh, heavy artillery. Okay, Fu Manchu, what's with the factory? You out of the way until the cloak of Kamehameha is mine. Which won't work, believe it or not, clever one. There's another Philip Marlowe who at the moment is a lot closer to that collection of fancy feathers than either of us. You lie. This stupid bit for freedom. A bit that will not get you any... Get up! A truck! Look out! As we hit, I slapped at his gun and then jerked the handle of the door and jumped. When I got to my feet, I was on the sidewalk and bruised, but better off than the China boy who was draped over the back of the front seat. A crowd that included a towering Hawaiian policeman who promptly told mine host to shut up gathered in a hurry, so I ran for a cab, gave the driver ten bucks the address I wanted, and took off. The street on which Lani Kaja lived was a neat curving strip that rose sharply from sea level up into the shadow of Diamond Head itself. We were there in less than ten minutes. Finding number 44 was something else. Another 30 minutes disappeared before we finally parked away from the place which was glass and Kona wood, tucked deep behind a thick grove of date palms. I told the driver to back down the hill without using his motor. Then I slipped into the grounds and carefully moved toward the house. Until what I thought was the trunk of another palm stepped into my path. Fast. Stop where you are. At the top, which was over six and a half feet, there was a shock of flaming red hair. The whole frame was half covered in dirty yellow shirt, once upon a time white ducks and battered brown sandals. Who are you? Someone with an appointment to see Miss Collier. Why? You belong to this place? Yes, and this place belongs to me as well. All of it, Miss Collier included. She's mine to protect, you understand that? Malahini. Malawich? Malahini, greenhorn tourist, a kind that I hate. A kind that's ravaging all that's beautiful, stealing the islands from those they belong to. Take it easy, Red. I'm not here to stick your pretty island in my pocket when you're not looking. Well, I want his words with Lonnie Collier. You're like the rest of them, trying with cunning and deceit to turn her head away from these shores and toward the mainland where you come from. I won't stand for it. Why don't we break this round table up and get to the house? I'm in a hurry. All right, all right. But I'm sure that Lonnie will be on my side. So sure, in fact, that we really shouldn't disturb the flower. Should we? Go ahead, we want to hit it! <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, this Wednesday night, Fred Allen will be Bing Crosby's special guest on Der Bingle's CBS half hour of laughter and music. 
Earlier this Wednesday, the winner of the $1,000 prize in the Dr. Christian Prize Contest will also be announced by Gene Herschel, star of CBS's Dr. Christian Show. And don't forget that Groucho Marx and Burns and Allen will also be here on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Cloak of Kamehameha. Red-headed lunatic with a slow, soft voice and fast, hard fit took me by surprise. I wound up flat on my back before I realized he'd so much as moved. By the time I got to my feet and took after him, he was sprinting for a bamboo thicket and had a 30-yard lead. It was all he needed to lose me completely. When I finally untangled myself from the jungle, I came out on the road. But then I heard a motor behind me, so I dove for the underbrush again just as the heavy car roared by. I had seen it before. In fact, I'd been in it. It was the limousine that belonged to the Chinese. The back seat was empty, but the half cash chauffeur Jolo was crouched behind the wheel like his life depended on it. And as I walked back toward the house, I saw that a door was standing open, spilling a shaft of yellow light across the dark grounds. I started up the walk when it came. <laughs> a second later, Lonnie Collier burst into the path of light and ran for the open door. I went after her, caught her by one arm, and spun her around. No, let me go. What happened? Why'd you scream, Lonnie? Back there. Back there in the pond, I heard a noise, and when I came outside, I, I found him there. Found who? Come on, show me. Oh, I, I talked to him just a few minutes ago. Yeah? And I gave him the cloak. No, it's gone. He's dead with a knife in his back. There. Look there in the water. Oh, brother. Who is it, Lonnie? Do you know him? Yes. Yes, that, that's Philip Marlowe. Skin on my neck crawled as Lonnie tagged the thing in the lily pond with my name. He was face down in the shallow water, and three inches of crooked steel and the ugly curved handle of a Chris stuck straight up between his shoulder blades. Somebody had made a very grim mistake, but it took five minutes of argument and a thorough checking of all the credentials I carried to convince the badly frightened Lonnie. I dragged the body out of the water and up onto the grass. And I went through his pockets. What did you find? A card. From the Hawaiian Island Art Products Company Limited, number 12, Harbor Street. Mean anything? No. No, I've never heard it. What's that on the back? Flight number and departure time of the plane I was supposed to take out of Los Angeles. Whatever he is, he's been one jump ahead of me all the way. Right up to your lily pond here. Tell me, was anyone with him when you gave him the cloak, a half cast in a chauffeur's uniform? Right? No, no, he was alone. I, oh. I gave him the cloak just as Schindler had instructed me to. Now, listen, Lanny, there was a down-at-the-heel redhead here just before you came out. He claimed to be a friend of yours. Yes, that must have been Lawrence Cochran, the poet. You're making him rugged these days, huh? Lawrence wrote one great poem years ago about two lovers who leap to death over the valley to keep from being separated and their souls turn into birds. It's still very popular here in the islands. Yeah? What happened? Lawrence got the habit of drowning himself in gin. And now the natives call him Papuli. Papuli? The crazy one. Yeah, well, that's closer. He's always hanging around. My mother wanted me to marry him at one time, and now that she's dead, he, he thinks he should look after me. Okay, Lonnie, let him keep thinking so. What do you mean? I mean, you can use a good watchdog right now. Oh. So when Cochran comes back, make him park on your doorstep. You but... stay inside and be careful. Those guys named Philip Marlowe getting knives in their backs. I've got a few things to do myself, but fast. I'd like to borrow that souped-up convertible of yours. Where are you going? Number 12 Harbor Street in the Hawaiian Island Art Products Company Limited. <laughs> Harbor Street was a narrow, twisting alley two blocks below King Street. A social sargasso where the derelicts of the Pacific quietly founded and died. Those are the damn crevices between warehouses. However, number 12 turned out to be a practically blank wall. There was one small window high up. A door with a heavy iron grill over the glass on which Hawaiian Island Art Products Limited, I.K. Lee, president, was painted in small black letters. And a thin passageway blocked by an iron gate at the side of the building. A light burned inside, but the door was locked. So after I'd ruined my shoe shine and skinned all my knuckles, I managed to climb over the gate and edge down the passageway to the rear. I could hear water running. So 
marble fountain playing in the center of a walled garden as oriental as the forbidden city. I eased across its rigid daintiness to an open door, peeked in, and then reached for my gun. Because sitting inside at a sleek white mahogany desk was the Chinese in the Panama. Well, well, this is a somewhat unexpected turn of events. Please, be careful with that gun, won't you? You be careful, Lee. You won't have to worry about the gun. Tell me something. Why'd you break your neck to get Kamehameha's cloak? You know what'll happen if you try to sell it? My good man, I can sell that cloak every day for the rest of my life. A few feathers at a time. Yeah? The world must be full of feather collectors. Oh, it is. I manufacture the beautiful feather lays that islanders wear on their heads. And while the bird is extinct, desire for its gleaming feathers is not... One or two golden mammal feathers in each lay. And instead of a mere hundred dollars apiece, I can get double that or triple. <laughs> now, do you understand, Mr. Marlowe? Uh, you know, you got things a little mixed up, haven't you, Lee? Lisa? How so? Your boy Marlowe is dead at Lonnie Collier's place. Oh, that. Uh, no, that was a Mr. Blake, an easily accessible gentleman I hired on Main Street in Los Angeles. <laughs> He only pretend to be you, for obvious reasons. Ah, oh, intercept the feather cloak, huh? Yes. I've known all about Paula Chindler's plan since their inception. I followed every move he made. In fact, it was I who caused all your trouble on the way to the airport this morning, by means of a bribe to your driver. Too bad you won't be able to keep your nest line with Kamehameha's bathrobe after all, Lee. Because I'm going to walk out of here with it, or big chunks of your face. You name it, where's the cloak now? Uh, I gather from this that you do not have it, Mr. Marlowe. That's what's known as a shrewd observation. Mm. And uh, that uh, Mr. Schindler, as I suspect, has tricked us both. You're stalling, Lee. I'm warning you. Start talking. Oh, that is all I wanted to find out. You're a... Uh, that is uh, judo, oh. Mr. Marlowe. Almost like magic, isn't it? Judo <laughs> can break your back if I tell him, Mr. Marlowe. You behave. Uh, Schindler has the cloak. No doubt about uh, it. So I must find him at once oh. with no interference from you, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, Jolo, you have his gun. So lock him inside. I may need him later. From something that half cast the under my spine. The edge of his hand, my, my legs were paralyzed. I felt like the practice dummy in a school for chiropractors. Every joint in my body ached when I moved. So I didn't move until the feeling oozed back into my legs. And I wobbled to my feet and looked around. There was a small high window I'd seen from the street. A heavy chair, a desk with a lamp, and something like a... like a picture framed in bamboo on the wall. I glanced at it and then looked back. I kept looking hard for a long, long time until I finally realized what it meant. The answer to the whole thing was contained in that bamboo frame. I had to get out and get out fast. I unplugged the lamp, plastered my back against the wall next to the door, and tapped on the lampshade to intrigue Jolo into coming in. It worked. The knob turned slowly. I threw the lamp up at the window. The crash brought the door open with a jerk, and the jerk stepped in with my gun in his hand. What's going on here, Mr. Mark? Where are you? Answer. Right here, Cholo. Okay. Now get up. I got some magic to show you. A trick I learned in Kansas called the Haymaker. I ran down the hall to the street door and out to the car. There was no traffic problem at that hour, so I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there right through the heart of Honolulu and up the twisting road that led to the mountains back of the city. The echoing roar of the motor as it tunneled through the forest lining the road was finally replaced by another roar. Wind. The unending gale that shrieks through a precipitous pass 3,000 feet above the city. A poly. I swung the car to the side of the road and ran the rest of the way. Out to where the rocks rose to a knife edge. that dropped a sheer 1,000 feet to the valley floor. Then I spotted them. Lonnie lying at the cliff's edge and standing over her. His red hair ripped by the wind with the mad island poet. Drunk as a lord and flapping around his shoulders like a pair of huge gold wings. Was the cloak of Kamehameha. No, no, no. My love, I offer you the freedom of the bird. Come, Lonnie. No, 
Don't let me go, Lauren. You're mad. Oh, no, Lonnie. You're the mad one. To think you could sell your treasures and leave the island. Oh, no. Your destiny is here. No, no, stop it. Stop it, you murderous lunatic. I tried to warn Schindler, but the fool kept on. I killed this Collier. The man you gave the cloak to. And I kill a thousand times again to keep you here with me. No. You belong to the island, Lonnie. Like this cloak and I. We must never leave. Come, no. oh, come, it'll all be over soon. And our souls will turn to birds. And live forever in this paradise. No, Fuck stop. It, stop. Marlo, help me. Stay back. Don't interfere. Jack, Lonnie. Are you all right, Lanny? I am all right. Marlo, look. The cloak. Yes. Cochran must have lost it as he fell. And the wind brought it back to me. It's strange, Marlo, but I, I don't want to touch it ever again. I know. I know what you mean. I'll carry it. Come on, Lanny. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Nothing like ham and eggs and good black coffee in the morning sun oh. to make one forget an ugly night. Uh, right, my friend? Oh, <laughs> you're absolutely That's right. all right. Yeah. Uh, more coffee, Phil? Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks, Lonnie. Uh-huh. So, uh, uh, Lee was picked up by the Honolulu police, huh? Sure. I had it all set up. He spent some time in prison. Mm. And Jolo, too. Uh, by the way, he was still unconscious when we got to him. What in the world did you hit Jolo with, Marlowe? <laughs> Enthusiasm, mainly. <laughs> and that's when you got away and came up to the party, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Phil, how did you know it was Lawrence and where he'd be? Well, it's all tied with that one popular poem that Cochran had written, Lonnie. Oh? That anonymous letter you got in Los Angeles, Mr. Schindler, was a line from that poem. Oh, um... Kamehameha's cloak of golden feathers and bring no less than... How did you find that out, Marlowe? Well, you see, when I was locked up in Lee's factory, I saw a full copy of the poem on the wall in a little bamboo frame. Oh. When I came to that line you just quoted, it stuck out like it was printed in neon. See, for me, that Peg Cochran is the killer. Going on that hunch, I, I try to look at things from his angle. He was a murderer, sure to be caught, desperately in love, insanely possessive of everything he thought belonged here in the island. And he was an unbalanced lush as well. The rest of it figured, that's all. Mm. I see. And when he was cornered, he went back to the one important thing that he'd ever done. Exactly, Lonnie. He was lost. Mm. So he identified himself with the hero of his poem and took that as the only way out. Amazing. Yeah. Truly an amazing thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a terrible thing, too, Mr. Schindler. Yeah. Well, we all got what we went after, didn't we? Each of us. Even Lawrence Cochran. <laughs> Catch a plane for the mainland, and Lonnie said aloha and left to get ready for our date. I sat on the lanai of the hotel and watched the sweep of the Pacific from Diamond Head to the hills across the harbor. The white sand of Waikiki to the green shallows over the reef, to the purple depths beyond. As a warm wind whispered through the palms, from somewhere I heard the soft strum of the ukulele. It suddenly occurred to me, what does aloha really mean? Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in tonight's transcribed cast were Wilms Herbert, Lynn Allen, Jack Crucian, Dan O'Herlihy, Byron Kane, and Peter Leeds. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. (laughs) 
Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a dead witness, a $100,000 bribe, the eyes of a beautiful dreamer and a corpse in a tool bin. We're all tied tight to the same thing. A fox's tail. <laughs> This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series, oh, and a Madam's Wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, for uh, listeners who've been listening to the show for a while, this may seem a familiar story, and uh, with good reason. Uh, the script was originally used um, on the adventures of Philip Marlowe uh, back on April the 23rd of 1949. Because of uh, lost episodes and such, um, we actually played that episode... Uh, back on October the 22nd of, uh, not of uh, 2014. So it's been a little less than a year for us. But still, this is a storyline worth uh, repeating with a lot of mystery, intrigue, atmosphere. Just a great tale. Of course, uh, there have been a couple of scripts that were somewhat derivative of prior uh, episodes, but this was the first uh, uh, full out-and-out uh, repeat and it was, uh, a very, as I said, a very well done story and worth playing again. All right, well, now we turn to uh, listener uh, comments and feedback. And we start with a uh, comment, an uh, email from Catherine, who writes, I could swear that Mrs. Demarest was voiced by Lucille Ball on this week's adventure of Philip Marlowe. Do you have any way to verify that? Um, love your podcast. Uh, keep up the good work. Well, Kate, um, in answer to your question, no, I do not believe that uh, Mrs. Demarest was voiced by Lucille Ball. This episode uh, that you're referencing was The Seahorse Jockey, which aired in 1950. By that point in her career, Lucille Ball was already a pretty established star. She hadn't made I Love Lucy yet, but she was the uh, female lead on My Favorite Husband and had been in a lot of movies. Simply put, if Lucille Ball was starring on uh, Adventures of Philip Marlowe at that point in her career, we would definitely know about it because uh, it would have been named in the credits and CBS probably would have made a big deal about it. There's a certain economics uh, when it comes to the way that detective shows uh, tended to function. You would have the star of the show, who would earn a decent salary. Uh, Edmund O'Brien, during his time on uh, Johnny Dollar, for example, earned $500 a week, uh, which was a uh, pretty good money back f uh, for 1950, uh, 1952. And generally, you would have the lead actor, maybe some uh, actors who have recurring roles uh, paid a bit more, but everyone else would be paid by union scale. And if you only worked uh, one radio show a week and you got paid union scale, you could probably eat, but you wouldn't eat too well. However... The nature of radio work was it didn't require a whole lot of rehearsals. Uh, there may just be one rehearsal and then uh, recording. And if you appeared on enough of these shows in a given week, uh, you could make a very good living. And that's uh, why we have so many episodes where Harry Bartell or Herb Vigren or Howard McNear make an appearance. These were people who knew how to act, who were professionals in the radio industry, and could play a wide variety of character roles, and could do several in a week, and manage to make that union scale work. You wouldn't have um, Lucille Ball coming out to appear on a detective show, uh, Philip Marlowe or anybody else's to uh, work union scale. 
in 1950. Uh, the shows that you would hear Lucille Ball in would be an episode of something like Suspense or Lux Radio Theater, uh, who would give her real star money. Yeah, outside of those big anthology shows, when uh, we're listening to a great detective story, the big thing you can spot are the character actors, the Alan Reeves and, um, and that sort. Uh, then we also do have a comment on Facebook where Francis says, love Gerald Moore's voice. Well, thanks so much for your comments. That will do it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with Nick Carter. And uh, join us again next Wednesday for another episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at...